Hey guys, it's Rainy Nights. I just finished watching Marvel's What If, season one specifically. Uh, I felt like, yeah, I will divide these into seasons for the reviews. Sometimes I just bunch it up into one big series review, but honestly, while I, this, this review is a positive review and it is a recommendation, um, I'm not, it's not really for me, so I'm not gonna like jump and go watch season two right now, so I'd rather just get the season one review and then we can do the two in the far future whenever I get in the mood to do that. But yeah, wasn't really for me, didn't like it quite as much as Vision, Star Wars Visions on Disney+, Plus, but it's obviously a pretty good thing. Um, and actually, it is canon, by the way. Uh, and if you're wondering how that's possible, it's because the multiverse exists, right? So there's uh, multiple realities and dimensions and all that. So this is technically canon, even though all the stuff happening in, in it is essentially non-canon as possible uh, on purpose. So yeah, we're also going to be ranking the episodes from worst to best, in my opinion. And uh, so stay tuned for that. But uh, yeah, I do apologize for maybe this being a little bit of a lower energy review than you might be used to in this channel. It's because it's just not something that gets me super excited. Uh, Marvel's really dwindling for me. Um, and the only reason I've been watching so much Marvel recently is because I have a Disney Plus subscription. So may as well get some use out of it. That's what I've been doing. And mostly it's been not very good. <laughs> but this one is an exception. This one is worth your time especially if you're a fan of uh, animation, um, and if you are just a hardcore MCU fan, I think this, would, that, this, is, this will be a lot better for you. As for me, I'm not much of a hardcore fan. I'm a semi-casual fan, but not a hardcore fan, so... Yeah, <clears throat> so... What If is uh, about we follow a new narrating character named The Watcher, who does exactly what his name in implies. He just... He sits in like the the center of the fabric of the universe, and he he literally just watches other other realities and the events that happen there. Um, so he we watch from his perspective uh, all of the varying different outcomes of potential what if scenarios. Like if you're a fan who uh, has ever thought of questions like this, what if Peggy Carter was the first Avenger? Stuff like that. And this series is aimed to answer questions like that. And uh, yeah, each episode, there's nine episodes, and each of them are self-contained stories. However, they do eventually culminate uh, for the penultimate and ultimate episode, eight and nine. Um, we eventually get one kind of major event and plot, which is that Ultron gets a hold of the Infinity Stones. He kind of wrecks Thanos in the blink of an eye, gets the Infinity Stones, and uh, he he's becomes such a omnipotent demigod that he notices the Watcher in the multiverse, literally like rips out into the multiverse, rips him out, and kind of forces his hand uh, to get involved when he's supposed to be just an observer. But yeah, that's like the one big thing that happens that like kind of uh, takes all of the characters from all the episodes and puts them into one big battle. But there's still some, I mean, th there's one episode in particular that has no correlation to anything, which is the zombies episode. So for the most part, it is just like self-contained things. But yeah, so overall, um, it's a good watch because it's uh, answering, it's an inherently interesting premise. It's a fan pleaser. It's a very effective nostalgia bait because it's taking you through... Actually, one of my favorite things about this series was this, just the fact that it's uh, converting iconic live-action MCU stuff into animated form. And while this art style, honestly, this is not, not my kind of art style at all. I don't like that each episode has the identical art to each other. I prefer Star Wars Visions where everyone is unique, very unique and distinguished from each other. Here it is the same art director through and through. So, but still... Just the fact that we're using animation allows us to do a lot of extra creative stuff and um, more easily do things that could not be done in live action form. Like they, if they were to try and make a zombie Iron Man in live action, it would not look nearly as good or appropriate as it does in this series. So this series is able to uh, execute some stuff and some ideas that you can't really easily do in live action, which allows it some extra creative freedom, which is good. I also really appreciated that 
at least maybe 80% of the actors are their original live action counterparts. A few exceptions, like this is not Robert Downey Jr., there's no Scarlett Johansson, but we still have Benedict Cumberbatch, um, Jeremy Renner, and uh, there's a lot more than that, but for the most part, everyone is reprising their roles from the live action MCU, which is a good thing. But uh, yeah, for negatives, I don't have any big negatives. It's just not my cup of tea. And the reason it's not my cup of tea is because it's just like, it's pseudo fandom. It's uh, taking, it's taking stuff that I've already watched and twisting it, which is super interesting for hardcore fans, but I'm just not a hardcore fan, so. But I did watch it all and, um, yeah, we are going to rank the episodes now, and I can talk a little bit more about each episode right now. So, the worst episode in my opinion, uh, and this is the only episode that's like actually bad in my opinion. I think all the other ones are like above average at least, but this one is the only episode I think is below average. So, in last place, number nine, what if Thor were an only child? This episode was cringy. It was comedic relief. Um, I, I believe it's Chris Hemsworth, right? So that's a good thing, but it, they use his old look. They use his blonde, shaggy hair from the original Thor. He just doesn't look like Thor, and he's not acting like the Thor we know today. He's a, a jokey Norse god that's, they're really playing on him for laughs, and it's just trying a bit too hard. So I felt this episode was kind of unwatchable and just really, really cringe. Personally, I mean the plot's pretty stupid as well. It's um, literally it's about Thor uh, going to Earth and having like the craziest party of all time, and it becomes too large and irresponsible that he has to like get Jane Foster's help to clean up his mess and control his out his out, his raging party. So yeah, I didn't like that episode. Number eight, Cap. Captain Carter. So what if Captain Carter were the first Avenger? This one is not bad by any means, but it is literally just a gender-bent version of Captain America the first Avenger. So it's like watching something I've already seen before, except now it's been gender-bent. And that's it. I also think it's kind of odd that Captain Carter uses a UK-symboled uh, shield because she's still an American soldier fighting for them, so I thought that was kind of weird. And uh, yeah, to the episode's credit though, it actually gives um, it gives Steve Rogers some other things to do. You would have thought he would be just out of the picture, not really relevant at all. But they actually give him some his his own kind of mech suit, and he gets to do something different as well. So, not terrible. Like I said, I only hate the Thor episode. Even Captain Carter is a pretty decent one though. Number seven is zombies? Question mark exclamation mark. It's dumb. It's fun. Uh, this is mostly for the design. In a series where the art is identical to each other, all nine episodes have literally identical art to each other, this one was like the one exception. I felt like this was the only episode that had unique art in it, and I just really enjoyed the designs of the, the characters, so that's the main reason for me. Number six, The Watcher Broke His Oath. This is the ultimate climactic battle episode, and probably the most important one to watch if you're like purely interested in the MCU canon. But it's not bad, it's a good fight, but I don't know. It, 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 the title of the episode's a problem. The Watcher broke his oath. What's the point of having an oath if you're going to break it? That, that's something that always bothers me in storytelling. Why are you breaking your oath? So the Watcher probably could have prevented a lot of catastrophes and disasters if he just got involved sooner. And MCU has this problem at large. For example, the Eternals. You know, they have to explain away why, a way why the Eternals never stopped Thanos. And uh, we're just going to run into this problem again and again as, as they keep introducing overpowered background characters. So, there's a million events that the Watcher should have involved himself in up to this point. And I just think it's kind of stupid that he's willing to break his oath, personally. Number five, Killmonger <clears throat> rescues Tony Stark. This one, this one, I live, really like this one. The reason it does not go higher is because Killmonger as a character is the exact same. It's sort of like a once a bad guy, always a bad guy trope. So whereas some of the higher episodes are going to like severely change the characters, this one does not change Killmonger as a character whatsoever. Same motivation, basically the same game plan, and it's, I mean, it's, that's actually kind of a deceptive title. Killmonger rescues Tony Stark. The real title of the episode should be, what if Killmonger 
won, or what if he gets his war that he always wanted, you know, because he actually gets his, he gets to be king of Wakanda, he gets to become the next Black Panther, and he gets to go to war with the American uh, powers, so, I don't know, Tony Stark's not a huge deal in this one, so I thought that was a bit misleading. Number four, T'Challa became a Star-Lord, which is also a weird title, I think it should be just became Star-Lord. Like, since when are there multiple Star-Lords? I don't know of any other Star-Lords. But okay, I guess that's probably the correct pronoun, or not a pronoun, but it's probably the correct grammar just because the multiverse is canon, so there are technically multiple Star-Lords. So, T'Challa becomes a Star-Lord. Weakest part of this episode is the title. Yeah, no, not just the grammar. I'm, I'm just, I mean, literally, T'Challa becoming a Star-Lord is the weakest part of the episode. Um, just... It's, I don't know, it's not even gender bent, it's just, th there's no, it's like a less charming version of um, Peter Quill, basically. So, really nothing changes there. The reason this episode goes so high, though, is because there's an epic boss battle with the Collector, who's usually a lame character. There's a pretty funny Howard the Duck cameo. Thanos becomes a good guy, and there's a lot of funny genocide jokes with him. So, everything surrounding T'Challa. I've never really been a fan of T'Challa. Obviously, rest in peace, Chadwick Boseman, but, you know, T'Challa's never been one of my favorite characters, so he's the weakest part of this episode, but everything else surrounding him, just the fact that it's very Guardians of the Galaxy influenced, obviously, is the reason why I like that one a lot. Number three, Ultron 1. This is just, this is basically, yeah, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's if you watched Avengers Age of Ultron, except Ultron gets to win, and he gets to do his omnicidal plan. That's actually a word I learned from this episode today. Omnicidal means death to hum humanity by via nuclear explosion. So he's an omnicidal villain that gets his hand on the Infinity Stones, and it's some pretty awesome fights. And this is also where everything begins to culminate, and we get to see a lot of returning um, people that maybe didn't get a ton of screen time, like Hawkeye and stuff returning. And uh, we never had Black Widow, I don't think, until this episode either. Number two, second best, is Doctor Strange lost his heart instead of his hands. This episode took me a couple of minutes to sort of digest, but once I digested it, I really appreciated it. It was the most emotional one, for sure, of them all. Um, it was a very cool concept. Yes, it's somewhat similar to the Doctor Strange movie, but not really at the same time, because Doctor Strange's love interest never died in the movie. So this basically, he gets stuck in a, a um, what's that called? He gets stuck in a paradoxical situation where he wants to save his love of his life, but it's impossible, and uh, it's just pretty cool. So I really like that one. And the number one best one, in my opinion, is The World Lost Its Mightiest Heroes. Uh, yeah, it's a bit of a corny title, but give this one a chance and it's going to impress you. This one, this one's literally, I don't want to spoil it for you, but it's about a good guy who has turned into a vindictive serial killer and is able to research and find the most effective ways to kill each and every single adventure and every hero on Earth. So even people like the Hulk, who are otherwise usually invincible, uh, this person, this individual, is able to take them out. So you get to see all of your favorite characters die horrific deaths, uh, which is something you're not really going to see a lot. So there's a lot of uniqueness to this episode, and I really liked it a ton. Uh, it also has a great boss fight at the end. Don't want to spoil who it is with, but very, very interesting episode, and personally my favorite. So, And uh, yeah, Samuel L. Jackson is voicing his own character here as well, so... I, he's a way better narrator than uh, The Watcher is, so... Yeah, I'm gonna give the Season 1 of What If a 7 out of 10. It is definitely a thumbs up. It is worth your time, but I don't really like the art style, and uh, the MCU is, has made me so tired at this point that it is kind of hard for me to get super excited about this stuff, but it is still a good series, so thanks so much for watching, and I'll 